Mormon Stories Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation. All donations to Mormon Stories are fully tax deductible and go directly towards keeping the podcast alive and towards building a community of support for Mormons like you. Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy when your way. So, um, before we actually kind of kick off, I just wanted to first uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, it's just such an uh, honor. It's such an honor to be here in Provo, Utah, right? How many, any BYU students here that's really able to raise your hands? All right. Got some BYU going on. Uh, it's an honor to be back where I got my, my undergraduate degree, so that's exciting. Um, we uh, we want to get going, but we... Uh, thought that I just I just wanted to kind of read off a list of people we wanted to thank. I um, want to thank uh, Valour for, for hosting this tonight and, and Corey. Um, we're super grateful to be here. This is a great venue. Uh, you're going to see him in a minute, but I, I want to thank publicly Tyler Glenn uh, for kind of helping make this possible and for uh, being here tonight to perform. You guys excited to hear Tyler? Yeah? How many of you are here just to hear Tyler? Raise your hand if you're just to hear Tyler. It's okay, I, I'm not offended at all. Uh, I wanna thank Troy Williams. Uh, where's Troy? Troy, are you? Troy's in the back, everyone? <laughs> Troy, uh, Troy is the leader of Equality Utah. They work really hard to help promote uh, LGBTQ equality here in Utah. And uh, so Troy, thank you so much for coming and helping make this happen. Uh, there's a booth in the back, an Equality Utah booth in the back. They've got some bumper stickers and other sorts of things, but Troy has an allies dinner every year that is one of the highlights of the year for many of us. So please, um, please remember that and support Equality Utah. Um, Want to thank Benchmark Books for being here with a load of books in the back. Uh, we do have books for sale. Uh, this is an excellent book. So please, uh, if you can, uh, empty the books there to um, kind of reward these authors. I want to thank Richard uh, Holdman and Chad Brown, our videographers. Hi, Richard. Uh, Richard's done all the pretty much all the videos for Mormon Stories, and Chad's helped out quite a bit. So, um, I want to thank Lindsay Hanson Park. Where are you, Lindsay? In the back. <laughs> Lindsay. All right. For those of you who don't know, uh, Lindsay was kind of the gatekeeper tonight, but she is one of the the leaders of Sunstone. Education Foundation, they put on a really amazing conference, actually monthly conferences all over the United States and sometimes in Europe. But uh, make sure and check out Sunstone uh, this July, right? It's going to be fantastic. They run a really great conference. Um, <clears throat> really briefly, uh, I want to thank also uh, everyone who supports the Open Stories Foundation. How many of you are supporters of the Open Stories Foundation? Raise your hand. All right, let's give them an applause. Honestly, uh, you, guys are, you guys are most uh, sort of responsible for allowing these events to happen because your donations go to keep the podcast and the foundation alive. And uh, I just can't thank you enough. So for those of you who support us, thank you. For those of you who aren't supporting us yet, we would love your support. You can just uh, um, donate um, at the mormonstories.org. I do want to announce just really briefly that uh, in our work with the foundation, um, we really try and uh, provide support for people who are transitioning kind of away from Mormon orthodoxy into either progressive Mormonism or post-Mormonism. But we're having a retreat um, April 1st through 3rd in Park City. Uh, and this retreat is sort of a three-day event, two-and-a-half-day event. It's for couples or individuals, but it's basically for anyone who uh, is struggling to deal with, uh, you know, faith crisis, a marriage that's struggling due to faith crises, dealing with extended friends and family, um, you know, peer spirituality after a faith transition. There's sort of all sorts of uh, things that we cover in these retreats, and they're really life-changing. So I've been advertising it a bit um, on Facebook, but a lot of people apparently don't check Facebook. So if any of you are interested, please email me at gmail.com and say, hey, I want to go to that retreat and I can give you the information. It's really a fantastic thing. I do also want to thank Joanna Brooks, the co-author of this amazing book. She's not here tonight, uh, but she definitely helped make this possible along with HarperCollins. So um, I think I've thanked everyone there is to thank, 
And so now what we're going to do is we are going to uh, invite a dear friend of mine, uh, Tyler Glenn. Uh, I had the, the good privilege of meeting Tyler just, uh, just a little bit ago. And our, the Mormon Stories interview with Tyler is in the bank. It's ready to be released, and uh, it's going to be coming out, uh, you know, in the next three or four weeks. But um, I was super grateful that Tyler was willing to come sing to us tonight. And so if you guys don't mind, how about we give Tyler a, a raging round of applause to welcome him tonight. this song a couple of years ago right before it came out um, so to me um, tonight it's very special but it's also for anyone that's having their own identi identity crisis and um, it's definitely a song of hope so this is called living in another world thank you very much Keep swinging in another room I'm daydreaming like a little kid at school Can't think, thinking of my teenage youth I'm alive, but I can barely move And I guess I've always been this way It's been hard for me to say Close my eyes, take me away, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been telling me to come of age. I've been going through an awkward phase. They've been trying hard to wake me up, saying stuff that never gets me off. Psychic cells So I found out how to trust myself I found out I'm stronger than the pills And I guess I've always been this way It's been hard for me to say Close my eyes, take me away Yeah Trying how to wake me up, saying stuff that never gets me up. I've been living like I'm coming of age, like I'm trapped in a cage. Don't mind me, I'm living in a, another world. I feel like I could die The four chords and a beat keep me alive And you can barely recognize Everything beyond my eyes I've been going through it my whole life Trying and wake me up 
saying things that never get me up They've been trying not to wake me up Saying stuff that never gets me Let's welcome back uh, John DeLynn and Alex Cooper, please, and Paul, the, her lawyer. Let's give it up again for, uh, for Tyler Glenn, everybody. All right. Well, uh, uh, let's be honest. How many of you have actually been able to finish the book? Uh, raise your hand. All right. We got a good chunk of us. Well, you guys know who we're, uh, who the guest of honor is. Um, it's been such a joy to read this book, and uh, I know a tiny bit about what it's like to have your personal life uh, kind of exposed to the world. And um, but it's a whole different, I think, level to have that happen uh, when when your story sort of involves the level of trauma and the difficulty that, that Alex Cooper has experienced. So please, let's give uh, Alex Cooper and her attorney, Paul Burke, a really warm, warm of stories. Welcome to the stage. So uh, Alex, welcome. Um, it's so nice to have you here. Paul, you too. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's just begin. Uh, a lot of you have heard the story, but since this is Mormon Stories, we're going to kind of cover it, but a bit more in sort of direct narrative format. And uh, we will we'll cover probably a lot that's in the book, but we'll also um, maybe stray a bit and talk about uh, some of the things that aren't in the book. And then what we hope to do is have some time at the end for a little bit of Q&A where you guys can can uh, answer some questions. So, so um, without going, uh, you know, too much into detail, Alex, why don't we start by you telling us just a bit about your kind of uh, experiences growing up in the church and your kind of memories of of being raised Mormon. Um, I have a lot of really great memories growing up in the church. It was my entire life going to girls' camp every year and packing snacks for Sunday school. Um, I, it, it really wasn't a bad thing. I, I felt really normal. Did, um, did, your, uh, did you guys have the family meeting and the scripture study and that, that sort of thing? Yeah. Pretty regularly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a favorite primary song? Put you on the spot. Um, no? The Sunbeam song. Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Um, good. And w which part of California was this? Um, this was in Southern California, Victorville, okay. California. Victorville. That's by Apple Valley. Is that yeah, right? like yeah. the armpit of California? It's not so nice. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Have you been to Victorville? Anybody? Apple Valley. Oh wow, a lot of you. Is it that bad? Yeah. Not so bad. <laughs> yeah. It is bad. <laughs> There's a little bit of division in the audience about that. Okay, so, um, and tell us how many siblings you, you had. I have four brothers and a sister. Yeah, so you're one of six. Yeah, I'm the youngest. You're the youngest of six. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any of your older siblings served missions or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah? They did. They all did? How um, many? Two of them did. Two of them did? Two of them did. Okay. Um, 
All right. So I think, you know, it's pretty common for people to, uh, you know, LGBT people to start noticing that they're different, maybe eight or nine, 10 years old. And then usually around 13, 14 is when they sort of start to realize that maybe they may be, you know, same sex attracted as, as some people refer to it or gay or lesbian. Uh, how, how was that for you? How was your experience sort of coming to understand your own sexuality? Um, I knew I was different. I didn't really know why. Um, I went to boarding school. Um, Catholic? No, all girls boarding school in England. <laughs> and um, kind of fell in love with my, my, first, my first girl crush, I guess. Um, and I, I didn't think I was gay. Um, I just thought this was super weird. Um, so that was like the first, first realization. Was that the viola player? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Seventh-ish grade, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I think I think I read in the book you were you were going for first chair. You were trying to yeah. take her out, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And you and you got it. Right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Um, we're not going to make you play the viola for us tonight. So talk a little bit about kind of, um, there, there's sort of a moment in the book where where you kind of were next to her and you kind of had an urge to talk about that for just a second, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I was like, whoa, this is weird. Um, I'm going to tell her. And I didn't because I was terrified. Um, I'm glad I didn't, though. Didn't Looking glad you didn't, back on you, it, you yeah. Tell her, yeah. But there's a part where you like wanted to hold her hand, is that right? Mm -hmm. But you didn't do it. No. Yeah. You held back. So at what point were you sort of, at what point did it sort of go from realizing that you were different, that you had a crush on this one girl to sort of, well, this might be more about who I am. Talk about meeting who you um, call Yvette in the book. Yeah. Um, I met Yvette, uh, I was spray painting trash cans for our recycling group at school and I met this girl and she she helped me with it and I just thought she was amazing and I, I realized I had a crush on her like it's my second girl crush oh my goodness and we really hit it off it's um, around 15 mm -hmm. okay um, and I just I wanted to tell her everything and I wanted to know everything about her and these, this is the same thing that my friends were telling me how they felt about boys. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> can you say that at the velour? Can you say, can you use that language? This is Provo. No, it's good. Let loose. You're safe. So, uh, should we keep calling her Yvette? Is that, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, so talk about how that relationship progressed. Um, we did everything together. I felt like I could tell her anything. It was, I think, like a normal relationship, um, but with a girl. Uh, and I decided to tell my parents because I, I knew they were going to flip out about it, obviously, but I, not to the extent that they did, because um, I could tell my parents anything. Um, so I told, I told my parents and, uh, they told me to get out of the house. Uh, so I did. And two weeks later, they picked me up and told me we were going to grandma and grandpa's house. Yeah. So would you, would you characterize your relationship with your parents as being pretty close? Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Do you have sisters? How many? I have one sister. One sister, okay. Mm -hmm. So mama's girl, daddy's girl, both? Both. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And you're pretty open with them? Yeah. Uh, and had you absorbed any sort of anti-LGBT uh, messages in the church or um, growing up? Was it ever even discussed? No, it wasn't really discussed at all. Um, so originally, did you feel shame or guilt about it? No. You didn't? No. So when you told him you didn't think it'd be a big deal or what? I knew they would be upset, but I didn't feel guilty about it at all. You didn't feel guilty? No. Yeah. 
Um, so you were surprised by their reaction. What was that like? Talk about how you felt when they didn't, when they wanted to, where did they send you when you, when you had to leave the house? Where'd you go? Uh, I, I went to a friend's house. Went to a friend's house. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, what was that like to have them have that reaction? Uh, I felt like it was, I felt like it was fair for them to have that reaction. It was fair? Um, because I, I didn't just realize it and then immediately tell my parents. I had some time to think about it, so I figured they need time to think about it as well. Time to cool down. Um, they didn't really. No, they didn't, <laughs> no. yeah. And I, I, I remember in the book, maybe there was, there was a time or two where you kind of stayed out past curfew or didn't come home. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's it, not was, awesome. Was that, <laughs> was that part of their reaction? or? Um, no. Uh, I did stay out past curfew a lot, but this reaction was completely different. Yeah, yeah. It kind of made everything pale in comparison. Uh, and then you mentioned um, with Yvette maybe a little bit of substance use, right? Had that come out to your parents at that at point at all? Not at that point. So that wasn't part of their anger or frustration? No. They didn't know? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so they get upset, and, and you're, you're sort of saying you were pretty understanding. You weren't heartbroken that they weren't more loving and accepting. You were just like, that's Give kind them of, time. Yeah. They'll get over it. Yeah. They have to get over it. Yeah, so you're thinking, I'm going to be gone a couple of weeks, and then I'll, what? Come back, start school. We'll Just kind of start school. And you were 15 at the time? Mm-hmm. What grade was that? Um, ninth grade. Ninth grade, ninth okay. Grade. So two weeks go by, and then what happens? You find out you're going where? I'm going to go Supposedly? visit Grandma and Grandpa in St. George. Yeah, going to while. visit Grandma and Grandpa in St. George. <laughs> Okay, so you t- tell us about that story. Uh, so, where my parents pick me up from my friend's house, and the car is completely packed with all of my stuff. Um, they say I'm going to Grandma and Grandpa's house for a week. This is a lot of stuff for a week. Um, but we we finally get to St. George, and um, I start bringing my bags into the house and. My grandpa's like, are you ready? Picks up my bags and walks back out to the car. And they tell me that I'm going to go visit this family, that they can help me. And what was that like? like what are you feeling at the, at the moment? Panic, where you're... complete panic. Yeah? Um, <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Um, you were panicked. Mm-hmm. Why? There were some secrets going around. <laughs> I had no idea what was happening. Um, yeah. yeah, like maybe we would expect a teenager to deceive a parent. Like maybe that's developmentally appropriate. What's it like to be deceived by your parents? It blows. <laughs> it really <laughs> sucks. Blows. Yeah. Is that the technical term? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did you feel? Describe your feelings at that moment. Um, I was, I was just scared. I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. But I thought whatever it was, I could definitely get out of it. Get out of it? Yeah. In what way? Um, there was no, I, I didn't think there was any way my parents were going to leave me with strangers. Um, yeah. I thought I could definitely get out of it. Maybe not that day, but the next day. Right. Cause you were a pretty ingenious kid, right? You thought so? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so grandma and grandpa, grandpa, get you in the car mm-hmm. and tell us what happened. We we drive a few minutes away and um really not far at all. But we pull up to this house and this lady comes out and my parents start taking my stuff out of the car. And I locked myself in the car. Um, grabbed my dad's cell phone, called Yvette, and then this giant man comes out of this house, and 
They unlocked the car and basically dragged me out of the car into this house. And um, I was like, wow, I stayed out way too many times. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> Um, and they, they sit me down and tell me that they're going to help me. Um, my parents sign over custody to them in their living room. Um, that, that's when my heart really sank. Like, even if it was up to my parents, it's not anymore. Um, so they signed over custody. My parents leave. And they start going through all of my things, um, telling me that all of my clothes are inappropriate, and um, going through my journals and just everything. Did your parents get a chance to say, sweetie, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it? Did you get that? Was there a point where they kind of said, we need to tell you what's going on? And what did they say? They said, they're going to help you. Did they, were um, they specific about how? No, they weren't. They left. Okay. So you didn't necessarily know, you thought it was for truancy, for staying out too much, or just being a hard kid. Okay. So that's a little bit, okay, I was surprised. So they, um, so they sort through your, your suitcases and um, get rid of a bunch of your clothes. They gave you some clothes, right? Oh, yeah. What they were the did. clothes like? They were real cute. Um, <laughs> Super modest. <laughs> real modest. Um, looked like they just grabbed a bag from the DI and <laughs> picked the most modest things in there. Um, long skirts, big t-shirts, fashion statement. What do you imagine it does to you psychologically and sort of identity-wise to have people picking through your belongings and then assigning you almost kind of a uniform. What, what, what does that do to you and your identity, your sense of self? And demeaning the clothes that you brought, right? Right. Um, at, the, at the time while it was happening, it just made me angry. <laughs> like, I'm definitely going to get out of here. You guys are crazy. <laughs> this is not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So there were some kids in the home. This we're going to call them. We'll call them the couple. In the book, it's it's Johnny and uh, Tiana, but we'll call them the couple if that's okay for now. And uh, so they had a few kids, right? Yeah. And then were there other sort of kids like you in the home? Mm -hmm. How many? Um, there were two boys, and then a third boy came came after me. Okay. Do you have any idea what your parents were paying per month to sort of get this help? I didn't know until later. Do you talk about that now or would you rather not? Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> um, I think they... Do you, do you remember how much? I don't remember precisely. It was, I think, about $700 a month. $700 a month. Yeah, it's not, it's not cheap to live in California, right? So, I mean, I imagine your parents were working pretty hard to be able to afford... That's like two car payments. I mean... That's a pretty significant investment for them, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. So, um, so what? So, tell us about how sort of the environment was and what the treatment was. And did they tell you what you were there to be treated for? Um, so, after my parents left, we sat down for a, a group, um, and I was introduced to all of their kids. And they asked their kids if they knew why I was there. And one of their daughters said, because she's living a bad life. And... Like, it's almost like you were an object lesson to their children for family home evening, right? Yeah. It's like, here's how not to be with these three other... Is that... Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Um... Felt really shitty. Like I was angry. I was so mad, but still angry. Still at that time, it's like I'm getting out of here. You guys are nuts. Yeah, yeah. So what did they say to you? So the so the kid said they're here for being bad or whatever, and then um, they asked why why my life was bad, and they 
they all raised their hand. It was weird. It's a weird group. Um, because she likes girls. I'm like, oh, wow, mom. That was when you first knew why you were there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how how'd that feel? Same thing, right? Yeah. Angry and sad. Okay. All right. Okay. So tell us how kind of the the treatment evolved. Um, so at first I just, I learned how to cook, um, cleaned everything. I got a backpack full of rocks and that was to fill the physical burden of being gay. Um, was there something you had done to sort of have that punishment be put upon you? Yes. I would not give them any information on my girlfriend. And why did they want this information about your girlfriend? Because she was 18 at the time, and I was not, and they wanted to send her to jail. Right. Now, um, you know, if I've got a 15-year-old daughter, right, um, who's straight, and an 18-year-old boy comes around and wants to date her, that's a problem for me as a dad, right? Like, so talk about, and, and Paul, you could jump in here if you want, like, is that a, do you think that's a fair concern, not a fair concern? I don't know the laws in terms of that sort of thing, but do you have thoughts or feelings about that from your perspective at the time or now? And Paul, if you want to add anything about that. Um, Is that a legitimate concern for your parents? I, I didn't think so at all because um, before I told my parents I was gay, I, I dated boys. Um, I dated a senior who was 18. And I was not 18, so this was this was definitely not about that. Um, okay, so if it had been a boy and he was 18, it would have been no problem. Mm -hmm. So that that in and of itself is hypocritical. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Do you want to jump in, Paul? Well, uh, here comes the adult perspective. <laughs> you know, in in the in the legal case, and even even as Alex's lawyer, I thought that the parents could have legitimate concerns about the age of her girlfriend. But what became clear uh, was that their real concern was the gender of the object of her affection. Uh, and that's something that throughout the case, you know, and we'll talk about that more later, I assume, but it became our burden to show what was really motivating the behavior of the parents in sending Alex to St. George. Okay. Alex, real quick, um, were there times in your adolescence where you had tried to change your sexual orientation, where you had done any of the typical things, praying to God to make it go away, fasting, extra righteousness, uh, uh, any of those, you know, date boys and just really try to be attracted, like any um, of that stuff? Yeah, I did, I did try to date boys. I didn't really pray about it. I I don't know why, but I didn't feel like it was a wrong thing to like girls, even though I um, grew up in the church. Um, I didn't really start praying to fix it until after I was um, living with this couple. In the house. So before that time, you just sort of felt like it was okay um, and didn't feel a lot of guilt and shame. You mentioned that earlier. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you know that there's a target. Now, before you mentioned, before the Backpack in the Rocks is mentioned in the book, I believe it mentions a few times you tried to escape. Is that right? Talk about maybe a couple of those times and what Johnny's reaction was. Um, I think the first time that I tried to escape, my second day there, um, we were at McDonald's in St. George, and I asked to go to the bathroom, um, and they let me. So I went and... I was just hoping there was somebody in there cleaning the bathroom or somebody, like anybody in there. And there was, there was an employee who didn't speak a lot of English. And I somehow got it across to her that I needed her phone and I needed her to watch the door for me. Um, and while I'm in the middle of trying to dial and get a hold of somebody, Tiana walks in and um, basically shoves this lady out of the way and grabs the phone from me and drags me out of McDonald's while I'm screaming the entire time and there's these moms with their kids looking at me 
Like, it's no big deal. Um, they did nothing. And because I wasn't successful in trying to escape, I, I got hit a lot. Um, yeah, so Johnny's reaction was to do what? He hit me. And it, it sounded like it, like the first one sounded like a, was it a punch to the stomach kind of hit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another time, belt, is that right? Yeah. Um, so awful. So you write really powerfully in the book about sort of when you're, when you're, kind of shouting, screaming as you're leaving McDonald's, right? That you were surprised at, at the lack of reaction. Do you want to talk about that really quick? Um, people looked up, they saw it was happening, and nobody did anything. Yeah. Nobody got up. Yeah. yeah, you kind of think that that would kind of set off some alarms, right? And maybe mm -hmm. get some support. So, so is it fair to say the... Um, so the, the backpack and the rocks weren't tied necessarily to those attempts to escape. Is that, yeah, Not really. they were separate. Okay. So were there any like ongoing educational sort of attempts at sort of re-educating you or reorienting you in terms of like your day-to-day -day experiences there? Are you going to school? Talk about like what the time is like day-to-day. Uh, so -day. They enrolled me in one of those homeschool packets at home. Um, they enrolled me and then never took me back. So I wasn't actually going to school. Um, so I woke up the kids, got them ready for school, made sure they had lunch, breakfast, cleaned the house while they were gone. They came back, made sure they had dinner. Everything. I learned how to be a mom. <laughs> it sounds like your parents were paying them for you to be a nanny to their children. I, is that fair? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And um, you weren't getting an education? No. And there was no, like, curriculum or ongoing anything in terms of actually trying to help you change or get better. Is that right? We had, we had groups. Um, led by? Led by Tiana and Johnny. Okay. Are they licensed mental health professionals? No, I don't think they finished high school. Didn't finish high school. So they're leading these groups without any training. And what are the groups like? Um, we would read about the plan of salvation and why I did not fit into the plan of salvation if you'll forgive an interruption, this couple, uh, both of them worked in teen crisis centers in St. George. So they may not have been licensed professionals, but one of the reasons why Alex's parents were directed towards them was because they had worked in crisis centers in, in St. George and it had developed a reputation within the community for helping troubled teens. So they, they had jobs with these centers, but then sort of on the side, kind of moonlighted with their own little operation. That's that right. Fair to say? Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, talk about the innovation on Mormon doctrine that Johnny shared with you about how your parents were not going to suffer uh, the loss of your presence in the celestial kingdom. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Right? He uh, basically told me that if being gay would. Uh, cast me into outer darkness, and my parents would be okay. They wouldn't have to suffer because a copy of me would be made. <laughs> and um, that copy of me would be the exact same. They wouldn't know that it wasn't really me. And I could live there. This copy of me could live there in the celestial kingdom with them. What did you, you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? There's not a lot I haven't heard of before. That's actually one I've never heard before. 
Well, I Revelation. Was, <laughs> was raised in the church, so I, I that's wrong. <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> but what an awful what an awful thing to tell a child, right? I mean, 500 different types of abuse, but, but what an abusive thing to tell a child. Um, so the, the backpack with the rocks. Um, now, we'll talk later about what their claim was regarding that, but talk a little bit about the time that they introduced that to you and then what kind of what the, the consequence ended up being for you with that. Um, Tiana came home from work and she said that she had this great idea. Um, she got a backpack and made some of the kids go outside and get rocks. And she filled up the backpack and told me that I was going to wear this backpack from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed to feel the physical burden of being gay. And this is obviously an awful sort of thing to have to answer, but like, what was it like to wear that day in and day out? It sucked. <laughs> um, it hurt. I would try to wear as many layers, um, extra t-shirts, extra hoodies, so it wouldn't dig in as much. And how heavy, like, do you have a sense, to give us a sense for how heavy it was? Like, a brick, like, a couple bricks, like... Um, like a school bag full of books? Say like 30 pounds, that's my 30, guess. 30 pounds. Um, and how many, if you had to estimate the time span that you had to wear this backpack, what, what would you say? Um, it started for just um, a couple hours here and there. Um, but then it was all day. And then there was a certain time that I would have to wake up and a certain time that I could go to bed. And then it was, I had to face a wall while I was doing it and I had to wake up earlier and go to bed later. It just got harder. So over a span of days, weeks, or months, are you wearing this backpack, do you think? Uh, months. Months? I think it was like a month and a half straight I wore the backpack. Okay. Um, talk about the, the specific punishment of standing at the wall and how long they would make you stand there. Um, so I refused to give them any information on Yvette. And so I would just have to stand there and think about my decision to not give them any information. How far from the wall? Um, my toes would have to touch the wall. And what do you think the longest duration was that you stood at the wall with the backpack? Um, I think the longest I stood there from five in the morning until four in the morning. And I mean, as we're hearing that, it like seems unbelievable. And it, there's a part of your book where you're even after this all happens, where your dad basically says what when you. When you talk about that, what does he say? Did that, did that really actually happen? Yeah, he kind of doesn't believe you. Yeah. Um, what's that like to stand there carrying a backpack with a bag of rocks all day? Like, um, it, it was different a lot of days. Some days it would go by really, really slowly. And um, other days I would just lose like hours and hours of time start and then look back at the clock and five hours had gone by and I had no idea where it had gone. Yeah, when Joanna first used the word torture, I had not read the book. I didn't know what she was talking about, but is that a fair description? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, obviously. So, so um, at what point... Uh, you know, we didn't even mention sort of that she refused to eat for several days, uh, you know, into the, into the time. And I think you carried sort of a defiant spirit for several months. Is that fair to say? Yes. Um, and it just seems like they clamped down harder and harder. Mm -hmm. 
talk about what events led to you just sort of breaking and deciding that defiance wasn't going to work anymore? Um, so on my 16th birthday, I, I always watch my Sweet 16 on MTV. Like, I wanted a car, and <laughs> I wanted to have a party. On my 16th birthday, my parents didn't come to visit because they, the family I was with told them I wasn't ready. Um, and I just, I couldn't think about standing at the wall anymore. Even if it, if it was only gonna be until I was 18, like I couldn't, I couldn't do that for three years. Um, so I took all the pills that I could find in the house and I woke up to Tiana with a spoon down my throat. And I, um, I gave up. It's like there's absolutely no way out of this. I've tried to escape a handful of times. Nobody's gonna help me. So I just decided to cooperate. After you tried to, to end your life. Yeah. Um, now, there, there were, there, you were allowed to visit your, your parents, I think, at least two times during mm -hmm. that. Um, and you, you tried to kind of tell them what was going on, right? What was their reaction? They did not believe me. Um, What'd you say, mom, dad? What'd you say? I was crying. Like they, they make me wear this backpack. I have to stand at a wall. They treat me like shit. Like you have to do something. Um, and before that, Tiana had told my mom that I had been trying to escape and that I was extremely manipulative and not to trust me. And so when you told your parents all that, what was their reaction? Um, my, mom, my mom cried, I think, because I was so upset, not because she believed me or I wouldn't have been there any longer. So she didn't believe you? And she sent you back, right? For me, one of the most powerful parts of the book, and honestly, I'm doing a tiny bit of projecting here, or at least identifying in ways that I could never fully identify, but one of the most powerful parts is the fact that you would stand there at the wall with the backpack, and people would come in and out of the house. Talk about that. Um, the neighbors would come in and sit down and watch TV, play video games. Um, the missionaries would come over for dinner. And I would have my dinner at the wall. Um, so I, I really felt like there was no help. Nobody was going to help me. What would the missionaries say or do? Um, they kind of look at me and... Uh, Johnny would say, oh, this is her punishment. She's done something really awful. She's going to stand here while you guys are here. Yeah. So they just walked by. So um, I've, I've sort of highlighted a tiny bit here that, that I wanted us to read. Do you feel like reading or do you want me to read it? Do you have a preference? You can go ahead. Do you want me to read it? <laughs> yeah. Here's the part that chilled me the most, the part that chills me still. People saw me standing at the wall, and no one said a word. And I just, I'm going to break in. I don't think this only applies to her situation. I think this applies to many situations that many of us can identify with, I think. There I was in the front hallway of the house, positioned between the entryway, the living room, and the kitchen. Throughout the day, whoever came and went from the Siali House, walked right by me. Already I knew from my escape attempts that I was invisible, that everyone trusted the Cialis, and that I was just another problem kid who deserved whatever, was, whatever she was getting, a girl so broken and confused that she even thought she was gay. 
Then it goes on. Um, just like the people in St. George uh, who saw Johnny and Tiana beat me in the grocery store parking lot with a belt, um, but could not find a voice to intervene. Just like the missionaries who saw me at the wall, but could not say anything to anyone to question who I was or why I was here. My parents were locked in by their need to believe and belong. So locked into their hunger for answers that they could not be with me in my questions and struggles as a gay girl in a religion that was so impossible for people like me. I did not blame them then, and I do not blame them now. Still, the realization hurt. It hurt me deeply. How do you make sense of people just walking right on by, and even your parents? It's, it's gracefully written here. Have you tried to make sense of how humans can do that? It almost seems unbelievable, right? How do you make sense of it? Um, with my parents, I, I know that they were doing what they thought was right. Um, for the people who walked by me every day, I have no idea. <laughs> they suck. <laughs> um, they should have said something. Um, my parents really didn't know what was happening, really had no idea the extent of what was going on. Even though, even though you told them? Even though I told them. Um, while, while I was there, I had monitored phone calls, um, and so I would say what they wanted me to say. Um, so I never really got to say anything I wanted to my parents. I was saying what these people wanted me to say. Yeah. So um, there was a point, I guess it was after your, your suicide attempt. It also mentions that you slept with a, a knife under your pillow. Is that right? Because you were contemplating using that as well. But um, um, so what did you do once they sort of broke you down to try and, and get your freedom? Um, I actually prayed really hard all the time. It just didn't make sense to me that I was going through so much and in so much pain and God wasn't helping me. So what would you say in your prayers? Um, I would ask to get better and to not feel the way that I felt and to have a stronger testimony of the church. And when you say not feel the way that you felt, what do you mean? I didn't want to like girls. I didn't want to feel that way at all because that's what was putting me in the situation. So you, you got to the point where you really wanted it to go away. And um, what was that like to say those prayers hoping for an answer? I, I felt kind of hopeful that it, that it might work. And? It didn't. <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> what, what happened? Um, I, I, just, I just kept praying. I went to church, and I, I, was, I was perfect. <laughs> like I, I bore my testimony every Sunday, and I played the part. And then I eventually was able to go back to school. Right. Um, in, there's a lot of talk about uh, reparative therapy with a, with a psychotherapist. Um, and believe it or not, it's still going on. Uh, but the truth is, you know, at, at Utah State University, we did a study of, of uh, 1,612 LGBT Mormons. And it turns out that attempts to change sexual orientation through a psychotherapist is not even the third most common type of attempting change. Uh, the number one type of attempting change is what you've already mentioned, which is trying to pray and fast and be extra righteous to make it go away. And um, what's really odd about that is that not only were 80% of those who attempted change did they attempt through righteousness, personal righteousness, that was not only rated the most common way of attempting change, it was also rated as the most harmful. 
Um, so if you can travel back to those prayers you were making and those attempts you were pleading with God to take it away, can you explain why so many of our participants rated that as the most damaging way that they attempted change, sort of offering those prayers and hoping for change. Why, why is that rated as the most harmful way of attempting change? Um, for me, it was so hard because there wasn't an answer. Um, I was told that if you do everything right and you pray, then God will answer your prayers one way or another. But I got nothing, nothing back. What goes through your mind and your heart and your soul when you plead to Heavenly Father to fix this and then it doesn't, he doesn't fix it? What goes through your mind? I'm supposed to be here. This is supposed to happen to me. Um, the only way this is going to work is if I go to these groups and I... But when Heavenly Father kind of disappoints you and doesn't fix you, what does that lead you to feel or think about yourself? Uh, I really suck. <laughs> um, that's how I felt. Then. You internalize that, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so you, uh, you kind of played the good girl and eventually they let you go back to school. So talk about how things started to change uh, at school. Um. Well, I, I finally gave them information on Yvette, kind of cracked. Um, what was that like to kind of tell on her, someone that you really loved? I felt like I could get her out of it. I just needed to do something quickly. So you told her, told, you, told them, and, uh, and that allowed you to go back to school, right? And then what, um, what pleasant surprises did you find at school? Um, Jason Osmansky okay. in foods class. J Jason? Mm -hmm. I'm going to move the microphone just a tiny bit this way. Is that all right? Okay. okay. So Jason, tell us about Jason. Um, Jason was a kid who sat next to me in three of my classes. And he just kept pressing me with all of these questions. You're new. I've never seen you. What's your family name? There's got to be somebody from your family that we know. Um, and I had a story that I was supposed to tell. I'm here. You were told what to say. Okay. And that was? Um, I came to take care of my grandparents. Um, and that's it. That's all I was supposed to say. Yeah, on the... I'm going back a tiny bit, but on the on the topic of kind of telling on Yvette, there's a point where they have you phone a police officer in California. Talk about um, how that how that phone conversation went. Um, Tiana put it on speakerphone, told me exactly what to say. The police officer heard her telling me what to say asked her to stop and she said oh no she's just nervous um, I'm helping her and was she being accurate in the things that she was telling you to say absolutely not <laughs> so what was she filling in um, that Yvette can got me addicted to drugs first and then that's why I was so in love with her and made me do sexual favors for these drugs that I was addicted to. That wasn't true. No. And they, and they sort of made the claim that she groomed you. I hate that word. I know, yes. it's, an, it's an awful <laughs> yeah. word. Well, yeah. Um, and what would you say to that accusation? No. Not she did true. not groom me. So, uh, yeah, that's crazy that she's telling you what to say to the police. Anyway, so you meet Jason. Jason becomes a friend. Mm -hmm. And tell us how that advances. Uh. Um, I finally tell him what's going on, and he introduces me to Delcy, the English teacher. And that's a Jason is a real name, right? Mm -hmm. And Delcy's a real name. 
So there, there are some names that have been changed in the book and some that are real, but we can celebrate Jason and Delcy. Talk to us about, about Delcy. Um, Delcy was the, the English teacher and um, the teacher who ran the GSA. Which is? The Gay Straight Alliance. Right. Um, and Jason brought me to her and I was like, no, Jason, I'm not going to say anything. These people know everybody. Um, You're scared. Why? Because I've tried so many times to get away in so many different ways, and it always backfired. And if and if the couple were to find out you were talking to people, what but was your fear? I would be wearing a backpack, facing a wall, and not going to school for another yeah. ten months. Right. Thank you for joining us today on Mormon Stories podcast. To discuss this podcast with others, please check us out at mormonstories.org. To join one of our 80 plus support communities across the globe, click on the support communities tab at mormonstories.org. To keep this podcast alive, please consider a tax deductible donation today by becoming a monthly subscriber at mormonstories.org. Audio and video for this podcast were provided by Richard Holdman. A big thanks to the Saber Rattlers for providing the music for today's episode. The Mormon Stories logo was generously donated by studiocase.com. Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy when you're